my, I titled my message, The Gospel's Impact on Marriage. Uh, so I do want to reiterate the gospel. Uh, my brother just well spoke it and laid it out. I want to do it once more. And, uh, and I do want to challenge. If you're sitting in a seat, um, and you just got to hear this, right? If you're sitting in a chair right now and you're saved, you know you're saved, just start praying for anybody that might not be. If you're sitting in the seat and there's a question about where you stand with Jesus, right? You don't know that you're saved. Or maybe you know the Lord, but you know you've been messing up. You're not where you need to be with God. Then all of this that we're going to cover, it's kind of null and void. It's irrelevant. You, you already aren't obeying God. We're getting ready to tell you how to take God's instructions for marriage specifically so your marriage could be right. But if you're not right with God in general, you're going to miss all of this. And so we don't want anybody to miss all of this. Amen. The gospel quickly. Um, the Bible just lays it out this way. Romans 323 says, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Amen. Amen. That puts everybody in this room on level playing. We all started at the same place. Um, we all started off as sinners. We've we broken commandments, broken rules, broken God's law. Um, then it says in Romans 5, 8, that God demonstrates his love towards us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died. That means that God isn't waiting for you to fix it. That's the problem some people have. They think they got to, I'm going to get it together, then come. And God is like, you'll never get it together. You got to come and I'm going to help you get it together. Some of us need help getting some things together. And you've been trying to do it without God. And you right now are sitting in a chair seeing how, how that's done, how that's got you. You need to come to Christ and let him be the one to help. Because God helps in a different way. He helps from the inside out. The Bible says that he, he, God is the one who works in us to will and to do for his good pleasure. So apart from God, I don't want to do the right things. And when I do, I don't have the power to carry it out. Amen. So we're all sinners. God loves sinners. He demonstrated that love and that he sent his son to die while we were in the worst possible situation. Jesus died for you and for me. And then he calls us to turn to him. He calls us to repent. Acts 319 says to repent, therefore, and be converted that your sins may be blotted out. And to get this, so that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. And so before we jump into all that we're going to look at in terms of the gospel's effect on a marriage, if you're here and you would say, you know what, I do need to get right with the Lord. I need help, and I'm not right. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to throw this invitation out a second time and just say, stand to your feet right now. I want to pray for anybody that would say, you know what, God bless you, bro. Don't be ashamed to do this, guys. Amen. <laughs> Amen. Anybody else? This is why this is so important. That there can never be shame about saying, God, I want what you sent Jesus to die to give me. Yeah. This, this, the Bible says every, every angel in heaven is turning up. Amen, bro. Amen. Every angel in heaven is rejoicing. Amen. Anybody else that's here, you know you need help. You need God. You need forgiveness. You need power. Stand up. Don't let anything hold you back. Don't let what people think. Don't let your worrying about anything else. Amen. Go ahead and stand up, guys. Wonderful. Wonderful. Know this, right? This is the help that you need is available through Christ. I'm going to pray for you guys right now. And I believe with all my heart. That God will honor your, your God's going to honor your decision to say, you know what? I need you, God. I'm humble myself today. I need help. And I'm going to stand up in front of people and acknowledge I need God. There's no shame in this. I promise you. God will help you. He will meet you. He promises in Acts 319 that as we repent, as we turn from whatever it is back to him, he says, I'm going to blot your sins out. And he says, then there'll be times of refreshing that come from this, being in his presence. You're going to be right with God when you leave this building today. Amen. Hold up your hands, guys. We're going to pray a prayer just confessing Jesus as Lord. Say, God, thank you for loving me. Let's pray it out loud. God, thank you for loving me. Thank you for sending your son Jesus to die on the cross for my sins. Thank you that he rose from the grave and conquered sin, death, and Satan from me. Jesus, I confess you to be the Lord of my life. I ask that you would forgive me of my sins, that you would fill me with your Holy Spirit. Give me your strength to walk in newness from this day on. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 
And I do just encourage you guys as um, the Lord just, he's just getting going, man. Um, as you just continue to, what you did right now, I acknowledge you, just continue to live that way. God will, I promise you. He'll t- God says, man, all things become new. He's not holding nothing against you. You start brand new today with the Lord. And let him build you brand new, brothers. Amen? Amen. Amen. All right. So as we move now into, I want to talk about marriage. And, and the first thing is, obviously, we, the, the gospel is the starting place. I don't believe, apart from the gospel, uh, you know, we got people in the world get married. They take something God created. But marriage belongs to the Lord. Amen? Amen. My brother so eloquently put it, that the, the idea of marriage began in the heart of God. Um, and, and he laid that out. So, you know, the first thing that was broke, the first thing God said was not good was man alone. And so say, mama, put him to sleep and make him a wife and wake him up and hook him up. And God performed the first marriage there in the garden of Eden before sin. They, I mean, they had it, Adam and Eve had it good, y'all. They were in the garden of Eden. Eve didn't have to be like, there was no other women to look at. You know, she, she wasn't competing with no other, you know. It was just orangutans and zebras and, you know, so forth and so on. So Adam was never, you know, there was never a temptation for Adam to be like, ooh, you know. Um, there was no comparisons, right? There, this is all you got. There's just, look, I'm the, I'm the best man you can have. It's the only man that's here. They had it, they had it good, you know. God delivered her naked, I believe. That's, I mean, it, it kind of alludes to that, you know. Told him to go be fruitful and mo- I mean, you know, they, they, they just had it good. They were in perfection. And then they jacked it all up, and that's, they were, here we go today. Here we are, you know. So it does really require, you know, for us that, that we be in Christ. Because the rules for marriage, God established marriage. And the first thing he did after he married him is he gave him the first rule. Once again, he covered it. You know, for this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother, be joined to his wife, and the two shall become. Adam and Eve didn't even have a mother and father. But God said from this point on, everybody else that gets married, their longest standing relationship will be with their mom and dad. And I'm saying that marriage becomes the number one relationship. And so for this cause, marriage, you're going to leave mother and father, and the two are going to become one flesh. Oftentimes we do a wedding and the bride is walking down. I tell the people that, look, as she walks down, passing up friends and family, and finally at the very last, she passes up her immediate family to be joined at the altar with her husband. This is a picture of what marriage is. Everybody else is getting ready to take a back seat. This is going to become their primary human relationship. Amen? So the person that you're sitting with today that you're married to, um, as a question for you to ask yourself, have I made this person my most important human relationship? Are they competing with anybody else? Your mama, your daddy, your brother, your sister, your cousin, your friend, your, your whoever. This is, they should be number one, and they should just know it. This is my most important human relationship. Um, that's, the, that's one of the beauties of marriage, that two become one. I don't, I don't become one with anybody else, y'all. Uh, I was a loved child, you know, I was my dad's junior. I was my mother's baby. I was her, you know, I, she don't like, she, she would, she would, my mom would say it and she shouldn't have said it. I was her favorite, you know, she's in heaven now, so I can tell, you know, but, um, you know, I was a loved kid, you know, but I'm not one with my parents. This is a unique thing. I'm not one with my kids, but I'm one with my wife. That's the, 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 I'm with the miracle of marriage, the two become one, a male and a female, different genders, different backgrounds, different personalities. And God says, I'm going to blend you guys and become one. You're going to function as one. That's what I'm going to do as you let the gospel permeate your life. You let me work my work in your life. And so I definitely want to get on some of the things that are challenging in marriages. But first, I want to tell you how what the gospel has done for you should reflect in your marriage. So we looked at Romans 5a briefly, right? It says that God demonstrates his love towards us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died. When a husband understands how God loved him when he was unlovely, when he was at his worst, and that God demonstrated that love in dying for him, he died for you when you were at your worst, I'm better prepared to love my wife like Christ loved the church. As Paul tells us in Ephesians 5, God tells the husbands through Paul, the apostle, I want you to love your wife. And then he gives us a qualifier. You know why? Because if God didn't tell us how to love them, we would have did it our way. I do love her. I bought her a flower. That, that's, how, that's, that's how we do. You know, I, I told her I loved her. I, I, I laid up with her. You know, God said, look, love her. How? Like Christ loved the church and gave himself. How did Christ love the church? That's a unique kind of love. He loved the church, period. Right? This, this is why, this is how come we can mess up and we come back to God 
Don't we all know he still loves us, huh? We know that even on our, mess, our worst day, we know that we can still come back. Many of us have come back to the Lord at some point in time because we know we can, because he just loves us with an amazing love. And God says, husbands, your wife, the way that she is wired and built, she needs that sort of love. She needs to know that you love her, period. So husbands, you can ask yourself that. Does my wife believe that I love her, period? Or does she think I love her if or when? Because sometimes, husbands, we can be very loving if or very loving when. If they do what we want, if they behave in the way that we desire, if you're getting the things that you want. But God says, I want you to love her, period, because that's how Christ loves you. And that's how he loves the church. Amen. So a wife needs to be secure in her husband's love, just like you and me are. We're secure in the love of God. We're secure in that. I just know God loves me no matter what. And so I, I, I always feel like this. If my wife ever had to come to me and say, do you love me? I would I would feel like I was failing. Right. She should just know. She should be like, this, this dude is stupid in love with me. You know, he just all, you know, it just it should just be, you know, emphatically evident in her life. Especially, you know, you want to love her, period, especially when she's not her best. Now, women, don't be offended. You, there's sometimes that you guys are just not your best. W women, say amen. amen. All right. There's just some time. There's some things that happen. There's, there's some, you know, periodic chemical imbalances and things that take place. Brothers, in those moments, those are unique opportunities to just, man, it, it's not, it, this is, those are unique opportunities for you to love her, period. I've had to tell men often there's only room for one female in the relationship. So this is important because some men are a little emotional um, and everything else. And if she's having an emotional, chemical, whatever, I, you can't join her. <laughs> right? You can't be like, well, you hurt my feelings too. You know, you, that's your moment to man up and be like, all right, she's having her thing or whatever, like, I'm going to just kind of, you know, I'm going to suck it up this week. I'm, I'm, counting, I'm counting the days, though. I know how this works, you know. you got so many days before you got to get it back together. Here's a Coke and a chocolate, you know. So, but we want to love them, period. Amen? And when they come out of it, they'll look back and they'll be like, oh, he's so sweet. He just, I'm sorry I was going crazy. You know, they'll appreciate you later. But if you act up with them, y'all going to be worse for the wear, you know. So, men, you, you need to be the stabilizer. Love her, period. Let that be your aim. God, help me to, help me to be to my wife what you are to me. Because I just know you love me, period. And you love me when I mess up. You love me when I'm not faithful. You love me when I don't do devotions. You love me when, I, you love me when I'm not who I'm supposed to be. And, and I know you love me. God, help me to love my wife with that kind of love. Men, say amen. amen. All right. Now, when a wife understands that Jesus submitted to will, the will of the Father. In Philippians chapter 2, verse 8, um, we, get a, we get a little bit about Jesus and what he did and, and the level of submission, how far he went in submission. In Philippians chapter 2, verse 8 says, And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Christ's submission to the will of the Father was all the way to death on the cross. Um, that's how far submission went. And so women, wise, when you realize the extent to which Christ submitted so that you might be saved today, um, I hope that it'll prepare you a little better to submit to your husband and just trust God with the outcome. Submit, submit is almost a cuss word in our society today. And I do want to give some clarity on that. Submit doesn't mean like, I would say my wife is a very submissive, you know, wife. Now she's a strong woman. Uh, my wife is an educated woman. Um, she got, you know, she brings a lot to the table. Um, submission doesn't mean that you're less than. It doesn't mean that you don't bring something of value to the table. It just means in the order of what God is doing, somebody's got to be in charge. Someone's going to be accountable for the decisions that are being made. And it's not the wife. It's the husband. God said, I put him I put the husband as the lead, as the head, not because he's the smartest, not because he's the most talented, not because he's even the better leader. God said, that just, that's where I put him. I, that's the guy there. Everybody's going to submit to how I want this thing to run. Now, 
if a wife won't submit to her husband, this happens, right? There are wives that won't submit to their husband because he's not a good leader. I don't think he prays. They, you, the number of reasons. And then those same women will complain, I don't want to like my husband's not a good leader. He ain't got no practice. You be usurping him all the time. So sometimes, you know, what hinders men from growing in their ability to be the kind of leader God wants is when they got a wife that's domineering and usurping and getting in the way. I could say this, over the years, my wife being submit, submissive has made me a better leader. I remember times early on where she would just say, you, you just, you know, maybe big decisions would be made. And she would just say, you know, you, you pray, you tell me, I'm going to just roll whatever you say. You have no idea what that did for my prayer life. Because I, I don't want to make the wrong decision. I don't want to leave my family. I got wife, I got kids I love. I want to make the right call. And so I'll be on my face. But for the Lord, if I need to fast and pray, I, I'm going to fast and pray. I'm going to pray until I hear so that I can say, like, all right, this is, I, now I've heard. Now I know. This is what we're supposed to do. Um, and I'm thankful. I feel like it's, it's caused me to grow uh, into what God wants me to be. And so wives are called to submit. And so for the women that are saying, what if, I, what if my, my husband's not a good leader? He makes bad decisions all the time. Um, he'd be jacking up. Don't, point, don't, don't rub him right now. Don't elbow him or nothing like that. <laughs> it's done. <laughs> Check it out. You do it in faith, right? There are two occasions. You can go look it up later. In Genesis 12 and in Genesis 20, there are two occasions where Abraham, the father of the faith, made some poor decisions in his marriage. He looked at his wife and he was like, he was going to Egypt. And he said, man, his wife was so fine at 80. I've never seen an 80-year-old that I was like, dang, you know, but he was like, look, she is so fine that they're going to see her and kill me that they can have her. Let's just say that you're my sister, which was a half truth. But a half truth is a what? Is a whole lie. So, um, so they went and he said that and um, she got taken into a harem. But, but she's supposed to have the child of promise with him. But now she's in another dude's harem that ain't got no part of the pro program with the Lord. And that's Abraham's fault. And what God did two times was he delivered her without anybody touching her. Abraham got rebuked. One king was woke up. God showed him everybody in your kingdom. I'm, I'm killing everybody in your family until you give that girl back to her husband. And the other time they saw, they caught him smooching. Either way, God intervened both times. She was protected and he was disciplined. He was chastened. As you submit to your husband, if he's messing up, he got to deal with your daddy. He got to deal with your daddy. And he don't want nothing to do with that, I promise you. Uh, God can do to your husband what you can never do. So if you just back up and just, I'm going to just submit as unto the Lord and pray. If he's not doing right, God, God will pull out the big stick and give it to him. And you just be there to just, just be, don't, don't say nothing. Don't, don't <laughs> just be there to say, oh honey, why, oh my goodness, I'm praying for you. <laughs> it, it happened again. <laughs> you know, just, he'll eventually get there. And, and you, you, have a, you have a good leader. But here's what happens, right? If you have a husband that won't lead, he's not doing what God wants. You got a wife that won't submit, she's not doing what God wants. You've effectively kicked God out of the marriage, so you can't wonder why it's jacked up. He won't listen to God, you won't listen to God because he's not listening to God. So God is like, y'all can have that mess. Somebody's going to have to turn back to me before it gets fixed. If, but if you get one person in the marriage that will do it God's way, God will work on behalf of that one person. And if you get two people in a marriage doing it God's way, you can have something juicy. Now it can get good. Amen? And that's what we're shooting for. We want two people in a marriage that are seeking to do it God's way. Next thing is this. When we understand that Jesus took it all, he paid it all for us, even to where he could say from the cross, it, it is finished. I believe as we understand that, right? Jesus, there was no point in the suffering and the beating and the humiliation where he fell back. He knew what was coming. And he endured it all on your behalf and on my behalf. And as I fixate on that, as I look at what he did, and how there seemed to be no limits on what Christ was willing to endure that I might be forgiven, I think we won't be so quick to say in a marriage, well, I'm not putting up with that. Or, I, this is, you know, I'm not going to, you, you're not going to do, you know, so often marriages break up and people go there, part their ways, and they've got, they've set boundaries and limits about what they will and won't put up with. Um, but, but I got to look at what Christ put up with for me. And I, that's, that's got to reflect in my marriage, right? I, as I look at what he put up with for me, I need to be, be a little slower 
to say what you will and won't put up with in your marriage. Amen. Amen. It's got to be a reflection. My, my, I got to be I got to begin to reflect through my marriage what I've received. I've received a great gift. I've received great forgiveness, great mercy, great grace. And now I'm in a marriage where God says, I want to I want all those things to flow through you. Are you forgiving with your spouse? Are you gracious with your spouse? Are you merciful? The same things that keep you in relationship with the Lord are necessary for marriage to keep going. Right. Is every marriage here made up of two imperfect people? Anybody here married to a perfect person? No, but it'd be, it, you know, what's frustrating is when you marry to someone that think they perfect, right? But I'm going to just tell you right now, everybody here is, is married to an imperfect person. So that's the reality. And so be, be, that being the case, we're going we're gonna to rub each other wrong sometimes. We're going to do each other wrong sometimes. And if there's not some mercy and some forgiveness and some grace extended, you're going to have a messed up marriage. You already know you with somebody imperfect. So when they do imperfect people's stuff, you got to be prepared. There are days where I got to just forgive. My wife, I'm sure, has had to forgive me a couple times in 22 years of marriage, you know? <laughs> I mean, just at least a couple, you know? Um, you know, we, there are things we got to work out. And if it's going to be good, though, there's got to be forgiveness. There's got to be grace. There's got to be mercy extended. Um, there's got to, we got to be able to put things behind us. How, the, one of the reasons we're able to move forward and walk with the Lord, God says, I don't remember your stuff, right? God's not, as I walk with the Lord today, God's not bringing up what I did last year. That I repented of, right? Uh, I'm walking in newness today. And some of your marriages are not able to get beyond stuff because some of y'all won't leave it back there. Every time you get into your emotions, you bring it here. Here it is again. That was four years ago. We, I haven't done that in four years. Can we? I was good this week. You know, it was, why are we talking about that again? Some of you guys, that's, that's, that's going to be, a, that'll continue to be a hindrance if you don't, if you don't walk your marriage out like the gospel. If you just want to keep bringing up stuff, God doesn't do that. God said, look, as far as the east is from the west, I left it back there. So you can, so you can begin to walk in news. I want, you to become, I want you to be brand new. God sets us free. He says, look, when you, become, when you get, come, come to Christ, he says, old things have passed away. Amen? Behold, all things become new. We got to give that to our spouses. Right? Sometimes if we're going to move forward, particularly if there's been sin, if there's been any kind of infidelity, and you guys are going to work on it and move forward, you're committed to do that then there's got to be repentance from the offender and forgiveness from the offended if you guys are going to move forward with that. Amen? I'm not saying that somebody can keep on offending and, and that, that ain't okay. But I am saying that if, if, you're gonna, if you're committed to walk it out, that the offender needs to repent and the offended needs to forgive. And you guys need to move forward in newness and give new opportunities to walk freshly. Amen? Last thing, um, and then we're going to talk about intimacy and communication, um, which could be two issues. But before we get to that, um, when I consider the depth of Christ's love for me, it says in Hebrews 13, 5, that he will never leave us nor forsake us, right? Never leave us nor forsake us. Even though we know we're imperfect, some of us would leave ourselves. But God says, look, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. Um, it's and I, everybody's heard this, but I don't know why I do enough marriage counseling where people don't adhere to it. We shouldn't be throwing around the D word. And by D word, I mean divorce in the marriage. That shouldn't be, that shouldn't be something you're throwing out every time they get on your nerves. Every time you, I just want to, I'm, I mean, I'm done. I'm out of here. I want a divorce. Ah, you know, that shouldn't be part of your regular conversation. God says, look, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. And as we walk in that comfort, we got, that's got to reflect in our marriage. Um, that's got to be something you commit to. We made that commitment in our premarital stage. Like, we're never going to discuss divorce. Uh, I don't, you know, that's, that's not going to be an option that we discuss. Um, you know, I might have to go upside our head. I'm just kidding, you know. But um, we're not going to discuss. We just, and, and, and the goal is, I don't want to leave a back door. I don't want there to be a, you know, a, if it gets rough, then that, there's just a back door. Shut the back door. And figure out how to work out things. You know, don't don't let that be a thing. You know, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. Um, we want that to impact how how we're dealing with one another. And if every time it gets hot, it gets difficult, you're looking for the door, somebody's gonna eventually find the door. And and that's why, you know, sadly, a lot of Christian marriages suffer the same fate as marriages in the world, even though we have the rule book. But if we don't adhere to the rules, if we don't walk this thing out the way Christ uh, entails it for us, it's going to be difficult. And 
Last thing as we move into intimacy, if you find that you are falling distant in your walk with the Lord, um, how do you recapture that? It says in James 4, 8, if you draw near to God, he'll do what? He'll draw near to you. And don't forget that in your marriage. If you find that there are seasons in your marriage where I feel like we're just getting distant, well, then draw near again. Do the stuff you used to do when it was when it was nice, when it was good, when everything was legit. You know, when 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 the church of Ephesus that have left their first love in, in the book of Revelation, the remedy God gave, he says, remember where you have fallen, repent and go back and do the first works. Go back and do what you were doing when it was good with you and the Lord. And some of us need to do that in our marriages. Some of you need to go back and, and date again. Some of you need to go back when you were trying to some of you fellas, when you were trying to catch her or you was talking all nice. You was available for phone conversations, you know. Uh, there was no limit of time that you didn't have and everything else, and, and now you got her. And she's like, where, where did that guy go? You know, it's like, I mean, you got me, and now you, another guy showed up, you know. And then women, too, you know. You was all cute, and it was like, hi, kiss, kiss, love, love, hug, hug. And now you married him. Don't touch me, you know. So we'll, we'll, come, we'll come to that. We'll come to that. <laughs> we'll come to that. All right, all right. So, real quick, um, in our relationship with the Lord, it's a special, we enjoy as Christians an intimacy with the Lord through Jesus Christ that the world don't have, right? You can call out to God and be heard. You are in a relationship with God through the person of Jesus Christ. Um, there's, a, there's a sweet intimacy we have with the Lord. Now, within a marriage, marriage is the place that God calls for physical intimacy. And I know intimacy is a lot more than physical. I just don't have time to go through all that today. So there's the, the intimacy of time, of communication, of conversation, of, of holding hands, of dating, of loving, of being in each other's face and all of that. And you need to do both. Um, but for the sake of our time here today, when I'm talking to single people, what do I have to constantly tell them? Don't do it yet. Stop touching. Don't be alone. Don't fornicate. Wait till you get married. You got you to gotta call them off. That's every pre-marriage counseling, just stay off of each other. Stay out of the dark. Don't touch there. Don't, you know, you just don't do it right now. And then you flip it over and get married people and you sit down and you're like, no, do it. Do it some more. You got, go home and do it. Why aren't you doing it? You were, you were dying to do it. Now you're not doing it. Go home and do it. If you get nothing else today, go home and do it. All right. So, amen. First Corinthians 7, 3 through 5 says, for y'all that need a Bible verse, uh, 1 Corinthians 7, 3, just let, let the husband render to his wife the affection due her. That, that, that word affection means conjugal duty. So husbands, if your wife is saying, hey, I want, you gotta, you gotta go, bro. Gotta, gotta put down the remote, gotta put down the ESC. If she wants, she, you gotta go, fellas, all right? As the men said. Amen. Oh, y'all say it like you mean it. That was, y'all missing the opportunity here, I'm telling you, all right? Uh, let the husband render to his wife the affection due her. Likewise, the wife says the wife does not have authority over her own body, but the husband does. Amen. <laughs> all right, all right. That didn't happen. So I, I, I'll, I'll explain. It says, likewise, the husband does not have authority over his own body, but the wife does. Do not deprive one another except with consent for time that you may give yourselves the fasting and prayer <laughs> come together again so that Satan does not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. A few things in this verse. First, it says that we're both to render husbands and wives that are rendered to one another affection due. Um, and it says that we don't have authority over our own bodies, but our spouses have authority. Um, if your husband is in need, I, is, this is an, an, a, a sexual need in a marriage. I say this, look, is you have a scratch that only they can itch. No, you have an itch that only they can scratch. I said that wrong, right? So. If I get hungry, I can go get a burger anywhere, amen? But if I have a sexual desire and need, I got one place to get that met. It's right here. And so husbands and wives, that, that your husband or your wife has needs that only you can meet. And so when they uh, make those needs aware, make you aware of those needs, you got to do everything. You got to do what's in your power to meet those needs. We want to render to one another due affection. Um, you want to get good at that. The longer you're married, it should get better. Practicing sex in a marriage should be part of a fair proofing your marriage. That I'm, we, you want to get good at, I want to just want to get good at pleasing this other person. 
And, and the more years you're married, the more, like, I know things about you that nobody else can know in one night. I know how to, you learn how to please your person. That's, God, that's what y'all do. And render it to one another. It says only, the only time you come away from sex is with agreement. That means we both agree, hey, next week we're going to fast and pray. We're going to fast. I don't know if I've ever fasted sex on purpose. Um, you know, there, there are periods of time where I ain't getting none, but I, I don't it wasn't spiritual. I, it may, I was praying, though, you know, so, but uh, so. It wasn't on purpose. So anyway, but you can fast and pray, but it's got to be with consent. We both agreed. And then it says something really important. Come back together so that Satan doesn't tempt you because the God is saying, look, this is an area where Satan will tempt you. So if you want Satan out of your marriage, he said, then get, get, get with it. Amen. So y'all go home and do the thing. Amen. All right. Uh, real quick. I just want to read this to you. It's in Proverbs 5. Verses 15 through 20. Uh, I just thought it was appropriate, and then we'll move on to the last piece. It says, drink water from your own cistern and running water from your own well. This is using, you know, uh, uh, fluffy language to say your, your, your spouse is your own cistern and your own well. You drink from your own well. Don't be out there drinking at the public fountain. Amen. <laughs> Should your fountains be dispersed abroad, streams of water in the streets, let them be only your own and not for strangers with you. Let your fountain be blessed and rejoice with the wife of your youth. As a loving deer and a graceful doe, let her breasts satisfy you at all times. And I tell my wife, that means I got to be able to get at them. You know, like I, I both be satisfied with them, bring them. Uh, you know, let her breasts satisfy not nobody else's breasts. Those, those two are yours. That's it. That's the only two. You got two for you. All right. And then it says, and be enraptured and always be enraptured with her love. The word, it means intoxicated. Just be intoxicated with her love. God wants us to continue to just be in love with one another. My brother was saying, man, the time you made out with your spouse. You used to make out. Y'all need to go home. Y'all need to get back into make out practice, you know, and just find you a little cubby somewhere and do this, all right? <laughs> in closing, last thing, and this is something that can be a real hindrance in marriage, um, is I just want to hit on communication real quick. Um, statistically, communication is one of the it's one of the high on the list reasons why um, people end up breaking up marriages. Or they're not able to handle conflict. They're not able to handle tense situations when they come up. And so there's three different types of communication: verbal, nonverbal, and written. And we want to be careful how we communicate within our marriage. Um, there are things that we can say without saying a word. So some of us that are smart and, you know, think we're smart. My wife is, my wife knows how to do this. So my wife could look at me and say, you sexy. My wife could look at me and say, you look dumb. She could look at me and say, I think you're really stupid right now. <laughs> but she technically didn't say nothing, but I'm like, I could put together her face and her body language and say, you saying you think I look dumb right now. Okay, All right. I, 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 I see how you feel. You know, it's body language is as sometimes as loud as words. So some of y'all, like, I didn't even say nothing. But, if, you know, you sucking your teeth, rolling your eyes, shifting your neck. There's a whole lot of ways to communicate. But here goes some things. Right. It's critical that we communicate effectively in a marriage so that we can function as one. So here's here goes some quick rules on communication. Don't talk. When somebody else is talking, that's an argument. Amen? So if you're going to communicate with your spouse and they're talking, when they're talking, you're waiting. Now, here's what some people do. Some people, when someone else is talking, they're not really listening. They're just waiting for you to shut up so they can say what they want to say. That's not listening. Part of communication is listening. So when my wife is talking, that means I got I to gotta tune in. Um, I'm hearing her heart. The Bible says from the, from the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. And so as she speaks, her heart is just overflowing. And if I'm a good husband or if, or if you're a good wife, you're going to pay attention to what's coming out of their heart uh, before you respond. Maybe you don't have a response right now, but you're listening. So listening is part of communication, um, not talking when someone else is talking, not just, you know, not just waiting till they stop talking to say what you want to say, but actually listening. Um, we have to know when to be quiet in communication. So if you're in the flesh, if you're overly emotional, if you're super angry and you have a track record of saying things you shouldn't say when you're angry, that'd be a good time for you to be quiet, right? I'll call it a sanctified shut up. Um, if I feel, if I sense that I'm in the flesh, I've never had to repent for being quiet, ever. 
I've never had to say, I'm sorry I was quiet yesterday. No, it was probably better for everybody that I was quiet yesterday because I was in the flesh and anything I said wasn't going to come from the Lord. So you need to know when to be quiet. If you feel like, man, I'm angry, I'm emotional, I'm in the flesh, I, then be quiet. Maybe you need to go spend some time with the Lord before you open your mouth and say something that you can't take back. Right? I, I expect to be with her until the rapture or one of us gets old and, 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 and we kick the bucket, you know. Um, I don't want to be saying stuff that, that's going to be, your words are going to be there. You can't take them back. You can say sorry for them, but you can't retract them. I remember things that were said to me when I was in elementary school. Like, I remember them. I'm not scarred, but I remember. I, I still remember stuff that was said. And so, you want to be very careful what comes out of your mouth to your spouse. Um, and if you're emotional, you're angry, be a good time to be quiet. Consider what you're going to say before you say it, because you can't get your words back. So sometimes it's good to say, you know what, let me think for a minute. I know I need to address this, but let me consider how I'm going to address it um, so that my words are chosen wisely. And, and I've even prayed to make sure I'm even supposed to do this because uh, I don't get those words back. Don't lose sight of the goal. Some people, in this, if you guys have argued, know this. You can start arguing about this thing. And then before you get done, y'all argued and y'all are all down the road up the street. And y'all, what was that about? What did we start talking about? You don't even know. Oh, y'all been, y'all been at each other's neck, you know. So don't lose sight of the goal when you're talking about a specific issue. Don't start attacking each other personally, you know. And my wife comes home and says, hey, you know, you, you didn't take care of the trash. I, what I shouldn't do is say, you didn't do the dishes, you know. And now, now <laughs> let, let me get it back off me and on to you, you know. The issue was the trash. Let's address the trash right now. You know that, oh, you know what? I'm sorry, babe. Let me go get that right now, whatever. You know that you want to address the issue at hand. But what some people do is, you know, you hit me with something. I got something to hit you with. Well, man, what about that? You know, when your spouse come and there's something that they don't like about your character, you know, and you, you find something about their character and throw it right back at them. That, what that says is this. Neither one of us is hearing or re receiving. Um, we're just attacking each other. And if you, if you create that culture in your marriage, it's not going to be a pleasant place to be, right? So if your spouse is coming and they're, they're coming and saying something that, that they're unhappy about, if you're a good husband or a good wife, you're going to take that in and say, okay, let me address that for them. Let me make sure that they see that they've been heard, that I've addressed it. Now, that's, not, that's how I can make sure I don't have to hear it again. Let me just address it. Let me make sure that that gets solved. And now we don't have to talk about that no more not throw something back in their face. These are all things that are just good communication things. Um, don't attack one another. We're on the same team. And lastly, don't get loud, right? Um, when you're talking, particularly about tense things, check your tone. Um, make sure you keep it at a certain level. You know, I, when I get excited, I get loud. Um, and it's okay if it's funny stuff or if it's, you know, you know but if, it's, if we're dealing with something serious, I got to make sure that, you know, I, I, I keep it at a, at a at a sit down face to face tone that I'm not getting loud with her. I don't want her to feel, I don't, I don't want my wife to ever feel like I yelled at her or I, I got loud or aggressive or whatever because yelling starts to feel aggressive, amen? Women too, because some, some women, y'all, you know, y'all get loud and aggressive too, you know? So um, here's a verse, Ephesians 4, 29 and 30. Um, I'll read that to us real quick. Ephesians 4, 29, 30 says, let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good for necessary edification, that it may impart grace to the hearer. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. And last verse on communication is James 1, 19. Be swift to hear, slow to speak. I right, just I want to listen a lot and talk a little. Um, I want to I want to be able to take in everything that, that my spouse is saying. I want to listen in and I want to be slow to talk too much or to have too much to say about everything. And as I wrap this up with us this afternoon, um, as you know, again, I believe a marriage, our marriages should reflect the gospel. Um, all the things that God has done for us, they got to they got to reflect how we treat one another. And I would challenge everybody to check themselves on that. You know, is, is am I a reflection in my marriage? Am I gracious? I've been a recipient of grace. Am I merciful? I've been a recipient of mercy. Am I forgiving? I've been forgiven for so much. Am I loving? I've been loved by the greatest lover ever. 
and we want, to let, we want to let everything Christ has done for us, and that's why we need to continue to be reminded of the gospel, reminded of what God has done for you, um, that it can flow through you to your spouse. Amen? Uh, I guarantee you, if we let Christ mark on us, mark how we treat our spouses, we will have better marriages. Amen? And then we want to also be good about our communication, and we want to get busy in our intimacy. Amen? And so everybody go home and talk well. Live out the gospel in your marriage and go home and do the thing. Amen. <laughs> <laughs>